Okay. Hello, my name is Robert and I'm in Palestine and I'm honoured to be sitting here with Nurit Peled. And I have a book here that everyone must read. And I was hoping that you might be able to tell us maybe how you came up with the idea of studying it, or I think it maybe it just happened. But also, I continually hear that the Palestinians teach hate and the Israelis teach peace. No, really. <laughs> so tell me, tell me about uh, your book and your study. First of all, the Palestinians don't teach hate because even if they wanted to, they couldn't have because they're so monitored, supervised and censored by Israel directly and indirectly. All right. By World Bank, by the uh, European Union, by, and by the Israeli military, really, and by the Israeli uh, Ministry of Education. So even if they wanted to, they couldn't have. Wow, you okay. See? So that's something that we don't hear. We, we don't hear about that. You don't hear about that. No. Uh, I have a colleague, Samia Alayan, who is a specialist in that. So you can, you know, you can interview her as well. Okay. So even if they wanted to, they wouldn't have, they couldn't. I mean, they cannot do anything. They, they can hardly teach about their own history in their books. Yeah, so tell me, tell me about that. So the, the, the Israeli government controls or has to sign off, doesn't it, on... No. Um, the books of the Palestinian Authority, which are studied in the West Bank and Gaza, are financed by the World Bank, the European, European Union, and some European countries. Okay. And they all monitor and and uh, supervise and censor it, so it's indirectly through Israel. In East Jerusalem, uh, they still study the Palestinian uh, curriculum, but it is controlled by Israel, so uh, um, they get a book where half the pages are blank, because they're erased, deleted. And yeah, uh, they cannot teach anything about themselves. They can teach, I think, Islam until the 17th century, but nothing that has to do with nationality and with, with today, you see? They cannot teach about the refugees. They cannot teach about the Nakba. And I'm talking about the Palestinian Authority, not in Israel. In Israel, the Palestinian students uh, study the same curriculum as the Jews, translated to Arabic. Wow, so that's... So they learn about the Zionist project and the redemption of the land and the wonderful project of settlement and occupation and this and that. They have maybe... Uh, just yesterday, a student of mine told her, me that she saw her niece's books and they have about two pages about Palestinian uh, history and culture. Nothing. They don't know Mahmoud Arwish. You see, but they do know Israeli poets national, uh, what they call national poetry. So they're not, they're not even allowed to learn about their own things? Oh, their no, no, own no. Culture, their... No, they don't. They okay. don't. I have a um, course uh, where we teach um, Arab teachers of Hebrew. Yep. And many of them tell me, so what I do, I mean, there's no program for teaching that. I teach the, uh, translation theory, so I made you know, a new program with a friend of mine who is uh, the greatest translator from Arabic. Okay. And, uh, so we took, you know, articles and we took uh, works and uh, so on. And the students say, and the students are all teachers, and they say it's the first time I read Mahmoud Awish. It's the first time I read uh, this and that. So that's incredible. Yeah. I mean, that's One of them you. told me, I thought it was uh, uh, the, the songs of Masel Khalifa. I didn't even know. You know? So that's sad. So you can't even learn about yourself. And uh, so they, they don't learn anything about themselves. Of course, they cannot say anything bad about Israel. And um, so this is slander. Of course, outside the ministry, you have all kinds of groups that uh, publish all kinds of books. Just like here, you know, you know about these rabbis who. Uh, who published books that say you can rape enemy women and you should kill enemy babies. And these books are given to soldiers. They were given to soldiers just before they entered Gaza. So, say, that, say that again, because that's really important. So, so they're given There are books. rabbis in Israel who wrote a few books, one called the, the King's Road and the other, I don't remember, where they say it's, according to Jewish halacha, you can rape enemy women and you can kill enemy babies. 
and this book uh, there was a trial and the rabbi he didn't get to jail but you know something and um, he's free now and he still teaches in the, and he's a rabbi not only one I mean a few and their books were distributed to soldiers before getting into Gaza you, you, I mean, but, uh, on but this is not the Ministry of Education so you not. cannot see these are textbooks yeah you know, everyone can publish whatever they want but but it's well known but they are not punished these people this is what I'm, I'm saying what if it was a Palestinian doing or that sort of thing? Or they, are, they are punished for something they write on Facebook, or and you know they're in Tatur and uh, yeah. all these stories. So they really cannot. They cannot even if they want to. Um, whenever you have the stamp of the Palestinian Ministry of Education, it is heavily censored. Yeah. I don't think they want to teach hate. I mean, this is another point for them. <laughs> you see, you teach hate and you teach racism when you want to dehumanize people in order to control them, right? Or eliminate them or exterminate them. You don't do it when you want to be liberated. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not useful. Okay. Yeah, so, so talking about that, the study that you did on the Palestine and Israeli school books. Yeah. And I think also the ideology and propaganda in education is a huge thing. This so, is not my idea. This is the, <laughs> the publisher. Yeah, no, but it, but it, it stands out of what it is. Yeah. So tell, yeah. tell, tell us about the, um, the study that you did. Because I think people need to realise that you're a professor. Yeah. You're highly educated. <laughs> and this isn't something that you just decided to do. It's something that sort of evolved. Is that yes, right? Yes, yeah. Well, yeah. When I started my academic career, I wanted to study the whole, all the aspects of educational discourse language development in school, writing development, um, classroom dialogue, uh, multiculturalism, racism, and so on. I went yeah. from one to another, and then when I got to the racism, you know, I learned it, racism in class, because racism in Israel is, uh, I mean, Israeli discourse is a racist discourse, not only towards Palestinians, but towards Jewish minorities as well. So I studied that. And then I wanted to see how the books use scientific discourse in order to convey ideologies there's a lot of study about that other places and I started and then I saw that the, the way they present Palestinians is is the main issue um, so you know so I did that and that's how this book came about and, and tell I, us and tell us about the book and the study what did you find well I find that uh, the books if there was a racist manual to write books they follow it by the letter okay wow. all the categories of wow. racist discourse are there both visual and verbal and rhetorical rhetoric you see because other people who study wow. israeli school books do content analysis and when you do content analysis you don't study the rhetoric so for example there was a big uh, discussion about whether israeli school books mentioned the nakba or not because uh, in an Israeli school book translated to Arabic, uh, it was not allowed to say the word Nakba or the Green Line or whatever. S but they do, they do mention the Nakba. But what do they say about the Nakba? They say it was for the best. So they justify it. They legitimate it. A posteriori, you see, by the consequences. And uh, so content analysis is not enough. Say if you, you know, Nakba or not Nakba. Yes, there is the Nakba, but at the end of the chapter they say that the Nakba enabled us to uh, uh, to create a Jewish state with a Jewish majority, and this was a miracle. This was the best thing we can do. A miracle. So they don't say how jolly they died, but the consequences mm. legitimate it. Okay? Yeah. We call it consequential explanation in semiotics. Okay. okay, you take the consequences and you make them into cause. It's very powerful too, it especially is. when people are it susceptible yeah. to. Yeah, propaganda. you have it in many places in Australia. Of course, yeah. all those uh, colonialist places and, and other places. Yeah. Yeah. So it's in use, and um, now racism. First of all, Palestinians are never shown as normal human beings, and in Israel you have hundreds of books because it's private industry only as terrorists, primitive farmers, and refugees. 
hordes of refugees that are, you know, threatening. <laughs> wow, so that's what they... And uh, you don't see a teacher, a doctor, a dancer, a real estate man, uh, I don't know, merchant, whatever. They are always defined as a problem, Palestinian problem, like the Jewish problem, you know, defining people as problem is... And this is throughout racist. all of the books, whether all it's books. geography, all the books. whether it's English, Hebrew, everything, whatever it is. Everything, yeah. They wow. are the minority, they are the problem, a demographic problem, a developmental program, because they don't want to develop, they don't want to modernize. Have they no idea, the Palestinians? That's just so opposite. Uh, yeah, and, uh, uh, and a security threat, of course. So they are a problem, they are the enemy, uh, and that's what the children know. I mean, they don't know anything else because they never meet Palestinians in maps. You don't have Palestinian cities in, in, in even inside Israel. You can have a map of Palestinian population inside Israel, and you don't have Nazareth, Acre, or Umm Fahim there. It's just taken out. It's taken out, and the the impression is that they live on us, upon us. You see, so the impression is very threatening. Universities in Israel, for example, there's a map. So you have this tiniest extension of a university in the Jewish colonies in Palestine, but you don't have any major Palestinian university. Or a, a map of Jerusalem where they show you cultural, governmental, and administrative uh, sites. They show you the um, uh, eastern part of the city, empty, except for the, Just empty? Empty, except for the Wailing Wall or something, you see. So there's nothing. The, the idea is to promote the idea that they don't exist, which is also in, you know, in uh, Israeli general life. They don't exist. They're not part of the economy. They're not part of the culture. When you say, for example, Israeli theater, you don't think about the Arab Israeli theaters. No. Or Israeli uh, cinema. Although Israeli Palestinian cinema is one of the best in the world, you never hear about that. Or Israeli literature or whatever. You don't count on music, the Israeli Palestinian one. Although they are, what, 25% of the population already. So they just don't exist. But there is this problem, this threat that we have to, to tackle we, in order to defend what they call our defensive democracy. And so I shouldn't laugh, but the democracy bit, yes. you know, it gets and, me. Um, otherwise, we should have another Auschwitz, another Treblinka. This is in the books. This is what I'm working on now, the Holocaust rhetoric of these books. Everything is to prevent another Treblinka or another Auschwitz. So from the age of three, I think you said, from the age of three it yeah. begins? Whether yeah. it's the, you know, so the propaganda starts at the age yes, of three. Yes, yes, and all, so, also and Holocaust that... education. Yep. I mean, on one hand, you traumatize them, yep. you traumatize them, you turn them into heterophobic human beings. They're afraid of anyone who is a foreigner, who is not Jewish. Because I see that in the, in the kids' eyes. I can see it in the soldiers' yes. eyes. That's yes. exactly what I can yeah, see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone is anti-Semitic. And so on one hand, you have this horrible ho Holocaust education, which is re-traumatizing every year. And this is starting from the age of three? It starts from the age of three now, yes. And on the other hand, you have this militaristic uh, education, a military man coming to the kindergartens and uh, so on and so forth. And, you know, children are educated to be soldiers. This is it. Because they need to be protecting the... Yeah, they need to protect their land, to protect. And, and so they are constantly in panic. And they mix, you know, when you're six years old or five years old, the ancient Greeks, the ancient Romans, Pharaoh, the ancient Persian, the Arabs, the Nazis are all the same for them. They all the time want to exterminate us, all the time. You can Im imagine, you know, Ethiopian children <laughs> who came yesterday and all this is imposed on them. They wet in their beds, they are terrible things. And, uh, so so they were in the bed because of the education. Yes, yes. Around the Holocaust Day and Memorial Day and all this. Uh, I volunteer here in the what they call absorption center, which is a kind of a ghetto that they built for the Ethiopians. A horrible place. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's what the mothers say. They, they wet in their beds. And uh, I went to read books to the children once. So they brought me very nice children's books. And I asked the little girl, what is it here? So, 
this is a soldier, he coming to kill us, <laughs> you know, whatever. And one, one little boy... Because kids boy, shouldn't be thinking this. One little boy told me the Arabs, they destroyed our temple and they drove us out of Egypt and they killed six Israelis in Germany, he said. Six, you know? <laughs> so it's all It's a complete up. brainwash. It's a brainwash. It complete, is a complete, complete. It's a mind infection. Richard Dawkins talks about mind infection. It's much more than brainwash. I mean, they, they grow up in panic. Complete, constant, permanent panic. Um, wow. So, so when they, um, because I know that, so they don't get fairy tales. <laughs> they get butchering stories about how everyone's after us. Yes. And then all so, the time. So when they get into some every like, holiday is accompanied by another massacre that is told. Whatever holidays we have, okay? If it's Hanukkah, if it's uh, Purim, if it's, it's a Passover, it always has to be with some kind of massacre, some kind of extermination, some kind of, and God saved us. What, 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 is, what do people do outside here? Because I know that I've spoken to a lot of Israelis, I've spoken to a lot of soldiers, and they believe what they're saying. So I was in Easter or in Jerusalem and I was talking to some settlers, yeah. colonialisers, whatever you want to call them. And I was asking them, you know, what do you think of the situation? And they said, you know, what situation? I said, well, you know, there's some stuff going on. You know, what do you think of the Palestinians? I don't think about them. What's a Palestinian? Yeah. They want to kill us. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. They, they, on one hand, they are absent from our life. And on the other hand, they are a problem that we have to solve and in school books they actually speak about the solution what's the solution never mind but the word solution in a jewish textbook is a little bit uh, you know shuddering wow. to talk about the solution to a problem which is human beings which is human beings yeah and so they're actually and also before i forget you told me at the um at your talk that when soldiers graduate they get given this particular book. The diary of uh, Meir Hartzion. Meir Hartzion was one of the most ferocious killers of Ariel Sharon's uh, murdering squad, you know, they were 101. And uh, he wrote, um, you know, there was this crazy um, trend in, in early Israel and before the state to go to see Petra see Petra and die. So uh, many people went and they were they, they really died because they crossed the border, they were murdered by oh, uh, the yeah. and so on. His yeah. sister was one of them who died. They used to go with a Bible and see their ancestors land and go to Petra. This was, uh, it was crazy. But he didn't die, he came back and he tells in this diary how he slaughtered the Bedouins with a knife. And everything that he did, I mean, he was, a, he was a crazy killer. And they get his diary as a gift. Every one of them. Every one of them, because he, became, he, he's, he got the title Israel's hero, you know. And he's a mass murderer. I don't know if mass murderer, but... Well, murder. to me, anything over five or six is mass. Yes, I so mean, th this, this unit, the 101, they used to go to Jordan and kill Palestinians there in order to, in the books they say, that they by these actions they restored the morale and dignity of the army and and the confidence of Israeli citizens because they showed the world that they can kill the enemy across the border they don't have to wait for the enemy to come in now in one time where you know because Palestinians would come in uh, for the crops mainly because the border just cut them off their fields and of course for revenge but mm. mostly for the crops but also for revenge and one day a woman and two kids were murdered in Yahud which is a former Palestinian village that was populated by Moroccan Jews and as a revenge they went this uh, unit and killed the whole village Palestinian village in uh, Jordan the Palestinian killers did not even come from this village, but it was convenient. Wow. And Ben-Gurion said, and it's in all the books, first of all, they denied it, 
and uh, Ben Gurion said, "Yeah, it's these uh, hot-blooded Moroccans." Uh, and then he said it was uh, Holocaust uh, survivors, and in a while they had to admit it was this elite unit. And uh, the reason they gave, and it's all in the books, the books that mention it, not all the books mention it, that um, the soldiers didn't know the inhabitants of the villagers were hiding in their homes that night. So they just demolished all the houses on the inhabitants. After that, the unit was dismantled because the world was uh, very angry. But he was one of the main killers. So his diary of how he slaughtered, you know, Bedouins with a knife and so on, is given to young officers. And so that's almost the completion of the racism. Congratulations, you're now here. Now become this man? Yes, he's, he's Israel's hero. You see? He's, I'm, f I'm flabbergasted. He died now, he died now, yeah. With, um, I was also going to ask, I've, uh, so in school, is there any teachings that says we're going to live with the Palestinians? Never. Is there any stuff that says the West Bank? Because it's only always no, 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 Judea no, no, and no, Samaria. No, 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 no. Israel never had peace education and never encouraged any peace education or coexistence or meetings or anything like that. They are private enterprises by private schools. You know, you have the bilingual schools, you have the Neve Shalom, you have these places, but officially there's never been a peace education or a peace program or a coexisting program. No, no, and they are, no. It's um, majoritarianism, it's the panic, you know, the anxiety, uh, there is this, uh, a scholar called Apadurai, he's uh, from India, and he calls it the anxiety of incompletion. He said that well, as long as this minority is alive, we are incomplete. And it's really the, one of the most uh, important uh, principles or ideals of Israel and Zionism is to be a Jewish majority. In order to keep the Jewish majority, we do anything. and. All this, there's an obsession with demography and with, with statistics mm. and really obsession. You see, how many they have, how many we have. You know? That's why they bring so many, all kinds of Jews from all over the place, the world, and non-Jews if they're white. And uh, yeah. in order to keep the Jewish majority, but this is a fake because if you think about the, the whole population which Israel controls, the Palestinians are half and even more already. You know, a little bit. So. Uh, well, I've I've seen what Israel's doing to the to the West Bank. They're trying to cut it up, trying to make life very difficult, trying to hide them yeah. even on the freeways. So they hide them in the books. They're hiding yes. them on the freeways as you right. drive around. And like Leibovitch said once, you know, you're you're going to encircle yourself with walls and more walls and more walls in order to 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 remain a majority. And that's what they're doing. And that's what they're doing exactly. That's what they're doing. And Jewish majority is the highest principle. This is the highest ideal. That's why you have to have children, that's why, and so on and so forth, you know. Is it, so is it, is it going too far to say that it is a racist society? I think it is a racist society. Well, this is why I'm asking you, I mean, you're a professor, you've done the studies, because I, I try not to, you It know. is a racist society from the beginning, not yeah. only towards Palestinians, towards Arab Jews, towards Ethiopian Jews, Yemenite Jews. It's a horribly, uh, and, uh, you know, one of the greatest uh, ideologues of racism, whose writings served the Nazis as well, was Arthur Rupin, who was in, in charge of settlement. And he, he, he wrote about eugenics and things like that. When they brought the Yemenites to replace the Arab workers, you know, this was the first thing. I mean, it was, and they died by the thousands, you know. And then they did the same thing to the Ethiopian, to the Moroccans, and so on. They brought them in, not in order to include them in the society, but in order to uh, not enslave them, but uh, asservir, I don't know how you say now, you know, to make them their servants. Yeah. And, and then uh, they did the numbers. And, uh, and, 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 to, and to keep the Jewish majority. So racism is not stopping in the checkpoints. For example, in textbooks, you don't learn almost anything about Arab Jews. They are all called Orientals 
and there is this very famous picture of uh, a photographer called Meir Gal, where he, he holds a huge history textbooks, and in the textbooks he holds it like that, with the four pages or nine pages dedicated to all Oriental Jews, from India to Yemen, you know, they're all the same. And what they write about them is anthropological. And the, the impression that we get from education is that well, all the Jews in the world were just sitting for 2,000 years waiting for Zionism to save them, but especially these barbaric, primitive people. And the, and the truth is that they had a glorious culture in all the Arab countries. They lived in harmony with the neighbors. They had a wonderful culture and nothing remained. If you want to study it somewhere, it's very hard. It's gone. It's gone. Because the idea is that really they waited for Alliance Francaise and all this, uh, uh, and the Zionism to save them. Uh, this, is, uh, this is horrible. Now you see uh, people who came from these countries, now, I don't know, three generations here, they are still marginalized. They it's always going to happen too, isn't it? It's never going to change. Uh, well, little by little they gain power, but it's very hard. I mean, mm. the, what is called, what was done to them is called in the literature cultural genocide. It's true. You see, this is what, yeah. and it takes generation to recuperate, it takes generation to heal from that. And now it's done to the Ethiopians, the same thing. Mm. Same thing, you see. So racism is in everything. It's not only towards Palestinians. This is the. Well, that's an important thing too. The, you said at the, the start. The discourse. This is the the way they think. Even small talk. When you meet somebody, first of all, they ask you if you're Jewish or not. And then, is that really? Is that the case? Hi, yes. how are you? Are you Jewish? Are you Jewish? Yes. And uh, and then are you? In uh, fact, just on that, I was asked Western that the other night. or Oriental Jew. This is very important. Oh, okay, so you have to go a little bit further. Yes, you have to. You have to. This is small talk. This is what they do, and nobody understands how racist this is. You see, so racism is in everything. And everything. It's, I mean, it's taught as well, and then it's lived and, and it's gained, it's, and it's taught in many ways. Yes, when you treat people anthropologically, what is it? It's horrific. <laughs> and of course, they don't teach about anything that about the people who are anti-Zionists, either in Europe or in Arab countries. This you can also only find in the ultra-Orthodox textbooks. Wow. About the rabbis who objected to, to Zionism, about the people who said yeah, yeah, so that's not all a good hidden. thing. Nothing. Is, um, is it taught that you know, God gave the Jews the land? I mean, I know, because a lot of people aren't uh, religious, but is that, is that something that... Well, in secular books, they just prove from the Bible that we've always been here. <laughs> because they don't talk about God. No, but they say the Bible's obviously a factual document and The Bible is a home. factual document, yeah. That's how it's taught? Yes, like a, like a document, like a factual histor historical document. And the thing is that... It's actually taught as a factual document. Yes, yes. God said it. Yes. Have you got a picture of him or a movie no, no, of, of him talking? Not. No, because you cannot wow. see him. You cannot see him. But uh, God, yeah, it's... it's the thing is, I mean, it's funny because real biblical scholars say there are no Jews in the Bible. So how can you say that you know, there were Jews yeah. in the Bible? Or, you know, there were tribes that were not very friendly to each other. One of them was Judea. And uh, uh, the word Jews is, all, uh, is only mentioned in what is called external books, not in the Bible. They were oh, like okay. the children of Israel. Yeah. So to say that the Jews were here, it's not, no, it's not true. There have mm. always been Hebrews here and uh, later Jews. That's true, but it doesn't say anything. But yes, it's a factual. King David, King Solomon, uh, uh, the Exodus from Egypt. It's an historical fact. Moses, uh, everything. So what? So what? What? Are, what does the world do? I mean, obviously Israel's not going to stop itself. No. It's going to continue on, continue on, continue on. Uh, what do we do? BDS. <laughs> it's the only way, isn't it? The government, the I think America and Australia, they need to stop funding, they need to stop. Well, America gives Israel, I think, $11 million a day. Because they need it. <laughs> a day. So if you get this sum of money, you couldn't care less about anything. But I Why not Gideon think... Levy says it's like giving a drug addict money? You go and Something buy. Something like that. 
No, but it comes back to them because they have to buy bombs from them. And then they have to use the bombs to make room for more bombs. So they bomb Gaza and they bomb Lebanon and they bomb all these places because they, they need a the room. And it never stops. So, what are we going to do? So, what are we going to uh, do? Know. But I think that a civil society can, can help with BDS and so on, of course. Mm. And of course with supporting all the good organizations that we have here. Palestinian Israeli organization or breaking the silence or all these Betelem and so on and so forth uh, which are today uh, a target for uh, you know I hope Betelem doesn't do legal cases anymore because the system's too rigged uh, I don't know about that but uh, they're all a target today of course so they should be supported both financially and morally and uh, I don't know hire lawyers that would not let uh, Bibi Netanyahu get off the plane, things like that, you know, to make. But it's all in the context of BDS, which is very important. Yeah. It, uh, it's not violent, it's very good. And of course, uh, encourage the Palestinians. It's anti-Semitic, isn't it? Uh, no, it's, <laughs> Ju it's very Jewish, very really. Angry. Yeah, it's not uh, anti-Semitic because uh, this kind of perverted version of Judaism that you see here, it's, it's very much anti-Jewish. Yeah. I think the perverted is a perfect word. It is. It's a very good word. It's completely perverted. And, uh, and it, I don't think that this version of Judaism has anything to do with Judaism outside. No. Or with Jews or with Jewishness, you see? Israel's hij hijacked that and made it something it's that it's a wanted. kind of uh, more Protestant way of Judaism, mm. you see? And uh, that's why they have such good relationship with the evangelists and the uh, Christian Zionists and so on. But this is not Judaism that we know about mm. uh, in other places. And to be a Jew is not that. Uh, Jews have always been cosmopolitan and uh, so on and so forth. And the first in every human rights uh, movement and uh, uh, new many languages, which here people don't. Yeah. They are, they are really uh, imprisoned in this very small language, which is kind of Creole dialect. Nobody speaks outside. They're living in a bubble. They live in a bubble and they try to, um, to pull the Israeli Arabs into this bu bubble because they have to know Hebrew in order to, to survive. Mm. And they always also try to enforce them to learn the Israeli curriculum in East Jerusalem now in order to get budgets, which they have to get anyway, but they don't. Mm. And yes, and you live in a bubble when you don't know any other language, then the only thing you can read or listen to is what is this propaganda, is this very, very thin kind of language and information. Mm. Uh, well, I think it's child abuse from a start to teach the world that everyone's against you, everyone's I after think you. It's, it's a siege abuse. mentality. Yes, this kind and of then, education is child abuse. And then they go to the army. You know, they go to Auschwitz first with rifles and flags and say never again and never do again. Do they really? So they go. They oh. also learn in Holocaust uh, textbooks that if we had a state and a strong army, we could have beat Hitler, which is completely nonsense. But they go to Auschwitz with a flag, with rifles. Soldiers also, accompanied by soldiers, and they shout never again, never again. And then they come back to kill Palestinians because everything is the same. You see? It was the Germans, today we need the Germans, so we don't go against the Germans, but we go against the, the new Nazis. Which is everybody. Which is everybody, and in this case it's Palestinians. Has, has a, um, just off topic, has a Israeli Jew served a lot of time in jail and convicted for killing a Palestinian? Never. 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 Because I, I, I find that one of the scariest things that I know that they can do it with complicity after all of the education that we've discussed. Yeah, complete impunity. Complete impunity for killing Palestinians. Complete. I mean, these last years, you know, when they started suspecting uh, or seeing uh, children with knives and they executed them on the spot. This is all right. Nothing. People would come and take pictures. This is all right to kill little girls that it's all right now this uh, Elio Azaria uh, uh, case is going I mean well, he's on supermarket bags oh yes Ami Levy which is the the biggest uh, chain of supermarkets in Israel but the poor boy you know this is what he was taught you know he's their excellent student 
He's a hero now. He was taught that a good Arab is a dead Arab, so he did what he had to do. And he's a paramedic. <laughs> he's a paramedic as well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but because he was such an ignorant creature, he knew what he was taught. And he couldn't so understand what, what was wrong about well, cause it. Because on that, it, sound, it seems like there's, there's no hope. Because from the education system all the way up to then being able to kill a Palestinian and get away with it. Oh, yes. Because I can see the 15 year olds now thinking, oh, I'm going to do that. Oh, all the time. Of course. Why do you go to the army to kill Arabs? That's sort of the same thing. Yeah. You, see, you have a lot of surveys, you know. Uh, what is called uh, Daniel Bartali is doing all these surveys all the time. Yeah, you can read his things all the time. This is it. And so they actually says, the, the reason I'm going to go into the army is because I'm, I want to kill, Palestinian, kill a Palestinian. You don't say Palestinians, you say Arabs. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Oh. Because they want to kill us. How do you know? We know. Well, I, I've asked many of them, uh, especially in Jerusalem, have you spoken to a Palestinian? No. Never. So, well, do you want to go to the West Bank? I've offered to come with me. And they said, no, they'll kill us. And I said, well, you know, I haven't been killed yet. So they believe it. It's, and, and I now see why, that it's, it's not even worth arguing with them. No, 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 no. It's not worth arguing with them. No, 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 no. We had uh, one of my students, little students from the Ethiopian uh, ghetto, uh, we were invited on... Uh, Ramadan to, to dinner with Palestinian friends and she was here visiting and I asked her if she wanted to come. She said, yes, but I'm not going to eat their food. And if they pray, I'll block my ears. And if they talk to me, I will never answer them and so on and so forth. Okay. She was 12. <laughs> and she said it with such conviction. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, but she came, you know, and then uh, she was received so beautifully. I mean, no Israeli child has ever greeted her like they did. There were about six or seven children around her age. And they had such a wonderful time. Yay. And they exchanged uh, book notes where she taught them Amahari and they taught her Arabic. See, that's beautiful. And she ate like she never ate in her <laughs> life. And she loved it. And she loved it. And then when she, we went, it was in Abu Tor, which is a neighborhood of Jerusalem. And when we came back, she said to my husband, Ami, Ami, when are you going to take me back to Gaza? Wow, that's fantastic! <laughs> because it's the, obviously the jolt of information. This is the Gaza, yes. yeah. She yeah. was so happy in Gaza. Did she go and tell her friends? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if she did, but uh, she's a very, very, very wise human being today. We need more of them. Wow, she's amazing, and uh, she does not. I, I asked her to write for uh, you know for a paper I'm writing about uh, uh, how she described herself her identity and so on. And she's like, I'm a person who likes to think and not taking for granted anything that I'm told. I like to see for myself and so on. That so is forth. magnificent. And then I showed it to my students and I said, who do you think wrote it? And uh, they said, well, probably her parents are professors and so on. And so a forth. professor? And then I showed them a picture of it. Ethiopian girl and uh, I told her about it. So she's, her reaction was, she said, life's irony is very funny sometimes. This is what she said? Yeah. <laughs> she's 12. No, now she's 17. Now 17? Yeah. But that's, wow. She was amazing. She's that, amazing. She, that is, uh, she's going to be known. And, uh, you know, but the only thing it takes is to teach them. I used to take them to Abu Ghosh to eat, you know, and when you come to an Arab uh, village, immediately everybody, you know, they're going to kill you with love and food. Yeah, love that's the you only and thing. feeds you. Yes. And uh, I took her uh, nephew the other uh, this summer, and uh, he loves to go there because uh, there's good food and nice people. And he said to them when he was six, "Are you Arabs? What you speak is Arabic. Really? You are Arab? Speaking Arabic? <laughs> you see, because, and it's what? It's two minutes. Yeah. And uh, this summer, <laughs> he's eleven now. I took him because he doesn't live here anymore. So we took him and I took him to the swimming pool and then to lunch and then and, and he enjoyed himself so much. And he went to the restaurant, uh, you know, the guy in the restaurant, he said, you're hummus and falafel. <laughs> Murder, he said. <laughs> that is so fantastic. That's all it takes. You see what yeah, I mean? That's all it takes. Yeah. And uh, yeah, she had a wonderful experience. I, th I think it was the, her best social experience ever since she came here.
That's fantastic. Because they are imprisoned in this ghetto. Everybody hates them. They think they are dirty. They think they stink. Well, they be- are they below the Palestinians? They don't. Are they? In the, no, not on below. The scale? No, no, okay. It depends, yeah. Because I've heard... Economically, of course. No, no, because I've also heard that, you know, because they are so badly treated. Oh, yeah, they the don't pro- even learn in the school of the neighborhood. They're taking out, they are transferred, transported every day, an hour, hour and a half drive to other schools because the whites don't want to, to study with them. Are you serious? Oh, yeah, I'm serious. So I could safely say that Israel and this is, is the a best very racist. lesson in racism to the white children who see the black children transported every day out of the neighborhood. I'm, I'm dumbfounded. I, um, to, but every, every, I get shocked. Oh. Horrible schools to, to school. And then you have, kids. And then you have in-school racism towards them, which is horrible, and you can never tell because, you know, officially they accept them, but they put them in separate classes, and they teach them... I mean, so they're, they're the same age, but they won't be in the same class no, as the whites. I met children who were three years in the country couldn't read, write, or speak Hebrew, because if they are in a separate class of Ethiopians, why should they speak Hebrew? And then I took them and tutored them. It took like a month for them to learn everything. I mean, they were so intelligent. I hear they're very, very And then, because of who I am, the school invited me, and, and, uh, and the teacher started crying. She said, I taught them everything. I said, yeah, you taught them, but they had no reason to learn if they are separated. So they're actually separating the kids. They're separating Blacks them. Blacks and whites. Segregate them. And then when this girl, when this girl moved, you know, when they get enough money, they can move. Uh, I called the principal of the school she was going to, because junior high, to tell her about this girl. I said, you know, you are you are receiving one of the most intelligent people in the world. <laughs> She's brilliant in math. She's a genius in athletics. She even performed on television. And she's fantastic in art. That's amazing, that's so... So the principal t- said to me, oh, you're a saint, you know, because I interact with them. You know. And then she said, we care for them so much that not only the lessons are separate, also the breaks. So what can you say? See, and I'm, these I'm, are things that I'm you, speechless. I'm speechless. That you learn from the children. I learned these things from the children because the school will never and they get tons of money for these separate classes. Because they need extra money because they need extra teachers. Extra, they need, extra room. So everybody everybody is prospering on their backs, but they don't get anything. I'm, I'm, I'm speechless. I mean, every day I say this that I'm shocked. Uh, there is a, what's going a, a on. one scholar that studies it, Ert, Esther Herzog. But this is happening today. Today, and they send all most youngsters to 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 boarding schools in order to finance the boarding schools. Terrible boarding schools, terrible abuse and everything. And uh, yes, and now her sister, who is also amazing, I taught the two sisters, and then the, the, the nephew. And, <laughs> the whole and, family, uh, I love it. That's yeah. great. And she's going to study nursing in nursing school. So first of all, they had some a week of studying for some time of the exam, mm. and I said, "Come sleep here, you know." With, so she came here with a friend, and they slept here. And I said, "Where are the others? Where do they sleep?" In a gym hall of a high school, on the floor, for a whole week, when they have to study. And now, she she's she wants to choose nursing schools, so. Uh, Israeli hospitals have a special stream for Ethiopians and Arabs, which is again a source of funding. So racism all over. I said, why? And she says to me, because we are here for 10 years and still are Hebrew, there are still gaps. I said, yeah, but, but this is not because you're Ethiopian. You know? And they publicize it, they advertise it as. You know, they will not have to do the psychometric uh, exams and so on and so forth. But they can do the psychometric exams. Easily. 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 You know? But they are in a special stream at the hospital. So, racism... This is South Africa all over. 
It is. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm still on the conversation when you say that the black kids have to be bused an hour and a half, or an hour, an hour and a half, past the white kids to go to a crappy school yes. that's miles away, yes. out of their area, because the yes. whites don't want to have them in their class. No, there's a quota. You can have, I don't know, a percent, but uh, I mean, you don't have to, you may. I'm, I'm just and in the school books, this is what they write, that schools that have too many Ethiopians are bad because then you cannot handle the problem properly. The problem. They are a problem from the day, from day one. They are a problem because they're black. David Sheen has this wonderful series about Israeli racism, you know. So he has an interview first with this people professor, look, Esther Herzog. People should definitely look him up. Esther Herzog, yep. about the Ethiopians, about her studies. Yep. And also with an Ethiopian uh, lawyer who was the, the army's DA for years. And you should listen to his story. How he was in a separate class until high school. And then in high school they told him to go to a vocational school. Not to a regular school. And he struggles and also, right? And then he became a lawyer and he became the army's DA. I mean, a very, very mm. gifted person. And he says, he says, I taught generations of lawyers, and all of them have the best jobs. When I, since I left the army, no one has offered me a job. It's racism. This is, uh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, so racism is not only towards Palestinian, but towards everyone who is brown, let's say, because the Russians don't. They are not put in ghettos, and uh, the treatment is different. And um, everyone who is non-Jew, and every, everyone who is not white. That's it. Israel's racist. Let's leave it at that, but I want people to buy this. <laughs> and, and I mean it because it was, I, I read it a few years ago when I was shocked. Because I used to think, like, the, you know, the world media would, you know, they, they get you. Get you. And then I thought, this couldn't be true. It's because it's that blatant. I actually thought this now, couldn't be true. Now, these are mainstream true, books. They are yeah. not the books in the colonies and they are not books in the religious sector. They are the mainstream. Which is important. Which for is us important. To know. And today, Everything is worse because this is until 2009. Since 2009, things deteriorated terribly. There are no Arabs in no book. <laughs> so they're actually just deleting them. Just a little. And no, no Ethiopians either. Hardly Oriental Jews. I'm, this is what I'm writing now. I mean, this is my I'll next, be, I'll be my next this book. Next and uh, yes, and yeah, it is. It's racist and fascist. And uh, it is. It's everything. And, you, and you've studied it. Yeah. Thank you for having us. <laughs> I'm actually here, if people are wondering. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. Okay.